So, and I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more because uh, <laughs> otherwise if I need to set a little context for what I'm doing here. Otherwise, you might be a little mystified. Now, does this does the slide come on automatically or for the PowerPoint or just hit this one or this one? Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, but I'm going to, as I say, I prepared these slides as I was instructed. Um, before I got to see any of the conference yesterday and to see what kinds of people and the kind of the character of the discussion. So uh, to try to set the stage a little bit, I prepared some additional commentary before I actually get into the slides here. And uh, I'm not sure with that if I'm going to make my time limit. But if I don't, I did also prepare a paper uh, where I, unlike most papers, I worked from the slides to the paper. <laughs> well, and uh, the, uh, what involved a lot of cut and pasting, so from previous writing, so, but anyway. So I'm a big, I have this paper available if anyone is interested. Uh, and I would say, uh, you know, from, I, I would say I'm, he, I, I, I interpret my invitation to be here as an attempt to um, add to the diversity of the discussion. <laughs> and uh, so in, in what way? Well, for one thing, I, I don't know that there was anyone here yesterday uh, who was a professional economist. And uh, I'm an economist by training. I have a PhD. Uh, I teach environmental policy, but it's kind of at the nitty gritty, like how does the Clean Air Act work and in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Uh, before that, I worked in the environmental policy trenches. So, uh, uh, you know, how environmental policy making really works in the kitchen, which is not always pretty, at the, in the Office of Policy Analysis in the Office of the Secretary of Interior. And another thing that probably distinguishes me is that I am not an active member of any traditional faith community. And uh, except maybe economics, <laughs> and uh, the uh, but even in economics, I'm a heretic. Uh, so uh, the uh, and I even I, I uh, wrote a book which I, I'm not shy about advertising things. Uh, it's called Economics as Religion, and it came out in 2000. Uh, and one, and that's definitely got me into the her heretic category. Um, the uh, I also uh, have a somewhat different take uh, on environmentalism and environmental policy from the discussions uh, yesterday. Uh, the uh, the my experiences, and I've had a great deal of experiences uh, in environmental policy have been pretty much what you would call in the secular world. And as I see it, the real driving agents, I mean the things that make environmental policy happen, like the in NGOs, civil society, EDF, the National Research, NRDC, these are essentially secular organizations. Uh, and my students, who take courses at this, because I'm in the environmental program, so I'm exposed to a lot of young students who are interested in doing something about the environment, are basically coming at it from a secular point of view. And uh, in this, but, in it, but I would, as you'll see, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, they're, it's actually a form of secular religion. But most of the, my students, I just had a conversation about this two days ago, are skeptical of traditional religion. And uh, they, they, uh, they uh, would deny or you know, the existence of a god. Most of them, there's an occasional, maybe one out of 20 <laughs> exception. And, uh, or certainly anything supernatural. And the, about the closest they're comfortable in coming to religion uh, is in saying something like, I'm spiritual but not religious. <laughs> and that's almost a mantra these days. And so they, they're, ide they're highly idealistic in many ways, but they don't f express their uh, idealism through traditional uh, religious um, institutions. Um, but this is where I, and, they, and, they, and so for them, actually, the word religion has a negative connotation. 
And so this is where I try to shock them a little bit. And uh, I tell them they do have a religion. They just don't know it's a religion. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, but and you might call it a uh, secular religion, but uh, of environmentalism. But for me, and I've been writing about it this way for, and also about economics as religion for 20 years. So for me, these secular religions are real religions. And, uh, and so the, the, if you might call it the territory of religion in America is actually broader than some people understand the word religion to me. And so, for example, I put Marxism in the category of a religion. And uh, now environmentalism is very diverse and resources for the future is very different from <laughs> Friends of the Earth. And, uh, but anyways, if you talk about kind of a core set of ideas which have explained the significance and the impact of the environmental movement, um, I would say it's a religion, a secular religion. Not, it's, it, it, not in the sense that you were, there was most of the discussion yesterday. And, um, but uh, the, uh, uh, and for actually for these students of mine and all, most of the people I meet who believe in environmental religion, it's actually a substitute, I would say for traditional religion. And the, uh, um, so they, they, they have a sort of a religious drive, but they don't find it uh, expressed in, in the conventional, the most conventional ways. Now, and I'm getting close to my talk, as you can see. <laughs> uh, as you can see, the talk here, I mean, you can see where I'm coming to, though, which is basically to argue that not only is environmentalism a religion, but it's actually much closer <laughs> to the original uh, Christian and Jewish religion than most environmentalists are aware. And uh, in fact, they're somewhat deluded. Uh, for a lot of them, the fact that they think it's not a religion is a big plus. So they're not happy when I tell them that actually they've just adopted a new set of metaphors and a new set of language for some, some very old themes in Western civilization, uh, especially those associated uh, with Calvinism. Uh, and so my, the second book I'm going to advertise, it's called The New Holy Wars. It addresses this subject in much greater depth. Uh, and it's called Economic Religion Versus Environmental Religion. And it's mostly about environmental religion, because I had already written a lot about economic religion. And so that came out in 2010. So I'm finally there. Uh, Calvinism minus God. Um, so the, uh, 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 and the theological roots of contemporary environmentalism. The core argument here is that basically environmentalism, not all of it, and there are obviously nuances, and Christianity is not monolithic, nor any other religion, and so you could say, well, I don't believe exactly that, and I'm sure it's true, but that if you kind of look at the essence of environmentalism, it amounts to a Calvinism minus uh, God. And uh, let's see. Uh, the, uh, so let's go through these slides quickly. I thought coming to a, uh, uh, I, I've had a lot of trouble in the past with the idea that a secular religion can be real religion. Uh, so I thought it would be impressive coming to a law school if I quoted from a recent New York Review of Books article by Ronald Dworkin, who died recently, but this, uh, he wrote a book which is gonna be published posthumously called uh, Religion Without God and uh, I don't have time to go through all of the quotes, but the gist of it is that Dworkin is endorsing a view quite similar to the one that I expressed. And that real religion, and we should consider the, the terrain of religion to include things even like something he calls religious atheism, uh, which are real religions. Richard Dawkins has a religion, that he, except he doesn't know it. He spends all his time writing negative articles about religion, uh, but he's as pious as anybody. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so, so anyway, so I'm invoking Ronald Dworkin to support me. Now, part of the motivation for this, uh, and so I'm actually exploring, in some ways, the terrain 
uh, of what's the fastest growing religious group in America. Astonishingly, I mean, this is from, in just five years, it went from 20, 15 to 20 percent uh, in the latest Pew Forum poll uh, in five years who say they have no religious affiliation. Again, for them, religion has a negative connotation. Uh, but most of them are still religious. In fact, they say spiritual but not religious. And uh, they have secular religions in my interpretation, so we need to study these kinds of things. Now another was, like, also in the spirit of this, if you were to say, what have been the most important religious writings of the last 50 years? Uh, the, uh, the ones that have actually had the most impact, uh, well, you can see, I won't go through them all, but they have been read <laughs> and in by generations and, uh, and, there, and uh, there's a pretty much of an understanding or a consensus that if you actually deconstruct these a little bit, they're essentially Christian parables. Sometimes explicitly so, Tolkien said that, uh, actually George Lucas said it about Star Wars, C.S. Lewis was a little more circumspect, but basically it's pretty obvious. And so, so what's environmentalism? Well, one way of interpreting it is it's like a, a religious story for adults, but also in disguise. And, uh, but for maybe for those 20% who are the nuns now. And so they still want religion, they just don't want it to be called religion. And so what do they turn? They turn to environmentalism. Uh, so, I've already said most of this, so I'll skip that slide. Um, so wh why do I say that environmentalism has a Calvinist flavor? I mean, first of all, it wouldn't be surprising if it did. Nothing has been more important in terms of in influencing the development of American culture and its beliefs and its policies and everything else. The, civil, you know, the uh, movement of free, the abolition movement, uh, then Puritanism, which is Calvin, American Calvinism. And uh, so if you wanted to understand why environmentalism has so clearly resonated, the, one of the simplest explanations is it's basically American Puritanism secularized. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and obviously that's going to really catch and, there's, and if you look at it, it has a moral righteousness, it has a sense of human beings committing sins against the earth as corrupt beings who fell in the Garden of Eden. Uh, sinners will be punished, there'll be new environmental calamities. Um, humanity must uh, reform its ways, build a new city on a hill. Uh, all these are, in one way or another, familiar themes from environmental writings. Uh, and so, I invoked uh, Ronald Dworkin, I'll invoke Donald Worcester, who basically says a lot of the same things uh, that I do, and uh, he talks about the Protestant, has written a fair amount about the Protestant <coughs> character of American environmentalism. And as he, I'll just read the last quote, the Protestant ascetic tradition may someday survive only among the nation's environmentalists who compulsively turn off the lights. <laughs> So the, uh, and so if we look at green living, I mean, what's green living? It's all forms of asceticism, basically. And, uh, or I co comb through the newspapers from time to time looking for good examples. So this was from the New York Times. Uh, it was a couple in Colorado. Uh, this is, these are quotes from the uh, New York Times. Um, the uh, Colorado couple, both in their 30s, also use natural cleaning products and are constantly drinking out of their Brita pitcher, so there's no need for disposable water bottles. Uh, all their personal care products are organic, and Mr. Dorfman's clothes are made from organic cotton and recycled materials, uh, including his now blazer, which he said is made from recycled soda bottles. <laughs> and But, you know, we're all, as... Uh, 
Paul said in Romans, we are all fundamentally flawed. <laughs> and so the first thing in religion is to admit your sins. And so this couple confessed in the same article, which is that they're addicted to disposable diapers. <laughs> and they haven't been able to overcome this addiction, uh, even though, as they said, not only do I feel guilt, I feel hypocritical. <laughs> And uh, you could uh, find this, uh, oh, probably 10,000 times, <laughs> repeated in the news articles of the last 20 years. And uh, so anyway, um, and another in New York, well, this is, a, I, I won't spend too much time on this, but this was a, they, there are now environmental consultants uh, in New York um, who advise people about how to live a green lifestyle, and they you pay them. I mean, uh, and uh, so anyway, the, the, this article um, described the, the role of these environmental consultants as assuaging the guilt of those who worry they are letting the planet down. Um, Calvinism and guilt, you know, there, there was something, some kind of connection there. Uh, so the, uh, uh, so another person uh, that I'll uh, invoke in support of this way, line of thinking is uh, Thomas Dunlap, who's a professor of American of history at Texas A&M University, writes quite insightfully. He has a book. Uh, this is the first book that I had seen anyway that really explicitly develops the idea for the full book that environmentalism is, a, well, maybe it's not the first, but it, it's a, it does it in a very sophisticated and explicit way. Uh, environmentalism is religious quest. And so this is what Dunlap is writing about Aldo Leopold. Okay, so he, again, this is, he's saying all, a lot of the same things I said. Did not e explicitly use religious language. Probably would have been skeptical of a, anything called environmental religion. Surely would have been horrified at the suggestion that he was helping to establish one, that he was actually a prophet. And, uh, but yet his work spoke to the religious dimension of life. Uh, and then uh, the last quote is a, the idea that I was offering was that environmentalism is a substitute for people who is traditional. They made a lot, an amazing number of environmentalists grew up in devout households and then gave up, left religion, traditional and almost always Protestant religion and Calvinist Protestant religion. And, uh, and move to something else. So anyway, so to offer a little support for my view, Dunlap writes that environmentalism is part of a broad historical, or uh, not environmental, Leopold is part of a broad historical phenomenon whereby ever since Emerson, Americans who failed to find God in church took terms and perspectives from Christian theology into their search for ecstatic experiences in nature. So I would say, no doubt about that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and Rachel Carson, um, these are some quotes from Rachel Carson. And uh, so uh, they are obviously, they have a deeply religious flavor. Uh, Rachel Carson, by the way, grew up like an amazing number of environmentalists in a Presbyterian household, Presbyterianism, and for those who don't follow religion closely, is the Scottish branch of Calvinism. <laughs> and uh, so, and she's talking about things that have, you know, long been associated uh, with religion, in traditional religion, and she's now experiencing it, though, in a more secularized context, but writing about it in this language, which with a few changes could have come out of a Christian you know, writing about the being in the presence or experiencing the presence of God in their life and so forth, a sense of awe and wonder, uh, recognition of something beyond the boundaries of human existence, uh, beauties and mysteries of the earth, are never alone or weary in life. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth will find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. They're symbolic as actual as well as actual beauty. Uh, and then there is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature. Uh, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after the winter. Now, if you don't think that's religious, 
<laughs> the, it's not, but there's no mention of God. So this is the explicitly. And actually, I don't really think that Rachel Carson ever wrote much about God explicitly or really Christian ideas, but it's there. And, uh, and suited to people like her. She was a biologist, like a lot of people. At least she was originally trained as a biologist. A lot of people who were brought up um, and then went, you know, studied science and so forth. <coughs> so they resolved the tension that developed for them by becoming religious, but saying, not calling it religion or not talking about God explicitly, but this is all about God <laughs> implicitly in a somewhat disguised way. So, um, so you know, just to... Uh, um, uh, mention a few things, uh, the Endangered Species Act, obviously, you know, and the idea that, that, that environmentalism is a secularization, I mean, this is, a lot of people have noticed this, but I just put it in here anyway, because it's such an obvious point, but yeah, the Endangered Species Act is the Noah's Act, <laughs> Ark of Our Times, we're obeying a command of God, um, no species can be allowed to go extinct, but then there are some further aspects that come from the first three. No questioning of benefits relative to costs. Why not? Well, if God tells you to do it, you don't tell God that the, uh, it's too much trouble <laughs> relative to the benefits. And, uh, or, you know, no, or if you don't say to God, well, you know, we have higher priorities here <coughs> on Earth than saving species. And, or, so basically, if you, if you want to understand even some of the policies and the way the Endangered Species Act is implemented, um, it really reflects more than just in the, you know, the surface aspect that the Endangered Species Act is sort of the Noah's Ark of our times, but the way people think about the Endangered Species Act and the way we implement it reflects a very, you know, traditional, uh, Genesis, originally Genesis-derived perspective on the matter. Um, so, uh, another argument is uh, that characterizes environmentalism. If you take economists, when I went to graduate school, we were taught that we were studying natural resource policy. What natural resource policy meant was we're going to use nature to maximize human benefits and human progress. Uh, so nature was a tool for human uh, maximization of welfare. That's what the whole ethos of economics graduate school was about. And uh, so how do environmentalists, they have a completely different way, of, you know, of thinking about it, uh, at least in, you know, to the extent that it reflects the, the tenets of environmental religion. Now some environmentalists have tried to blend these things together by creating ecological economics, but uh, I would say it's uh, a little like trying to marry Christianity and Buddhism or something like that. And uh, it really doesn't work very well. Uh, it, it just leads to a lot of, uh, of, uh, of poorly developed uh, arguments. But so what is nature from an environmental point of view? Well, it has intrinsic value. So nature does not depend on human benefits or human welfare or the protection of nature. Uh, it has this uh, value which is, comes from something outside human concerns or human beings. Or even ultimately, if you carry it to its full logic, outside even human thoughts. Um, and because if, if you're thinking about it and that's why you do it, that's an anthropomorphic uh, motivation in your treatment of nature. So where would it come from? Well, really, again, it implicitly has to be that it comes from God. That we're talking about God's creation. And uh, that's what intrinsic value <laughs> means, is that God created it. It's his creation. It's not human beings' creation. They, they have to do what God tells them. And so, but most people don't take that last step of logic. They just stop at saying nature has intrinsic value. Um, modern science and economics, what's the problem there? Well, uh, it gives human beings the power to play God with the world. And it does. 
I mean, that's what climate change, you know, what we're uh, is about. It's the ultimate plain God of the world. <clears throat> we're not just changing some particular pieces of land. Uh, we're changing the whole climate of the earth. And there's not going to be any wild areas anywhere on earth, the way things are going. And so, um, so what, I mean, this is evil. There's, uh, at least in any kind of biblical or environmental, for many environmentalists, it's evil too. And so human beings are worshiping a false god. That's the god of economics, <laughs> or, the, 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 uh, or of economic progress. <clears throat> and so what does God do uh, to those who challenge God's authority? Well, we know what God does. He doesn't like it, and he imposes severe punishment, like floods, Noah's Ark, uh, earthquakes, pestilence, drought, etc. Um, and it actually all sounds remarkably similar <laughs> to the prophecies of doom and gloom uh, that have been associated with the environmental movement, uh, which will come. Again, it doesn't. The environmental movement doesn't put it this way, but basically, it mirrors almost exactly a biblical understanding of what's going on. And uh, and so it's sort of you could say it secularizes Genesis or secularizes the Old Testament. <laughs> And, uh, and God will severely punish us. So uh, I'll skip, I'm running short on time. Uh, so the gist of these two slides is if you read Deuteronomy, and it's all about what I just said, and then you read Al Gore, it sounds just like Deuteronomy. <laughs> and, uh, the, but minus God. <laughs> and that's the Calvinism minus God stuff. Uh, but you'll have to, if you want, to, you can get my paper. Uh, so, and here's some more, just historical. Mark Stoll is one of the better historians of the American environmental movement. He's made the observation that virtually all founding ecologists had Protestant backgrounds. Uh, as he interprets it in America, specifically ecology is a science crystallized mainly out of the Calvinist Puritan tradition as a modified and handed down from New England transcendentalism. Almost no founders and main leaders of American environmentalism over the past 100 years had Catholic backgrounds, and only Robert Marshall, as far as I could think of, was Jewish, <laughs> until maybe Barry Commoner, but Barry Commoner was a, a more of a scientist, a public health person, than an environmentalist in the sense that I'm talking about. So, so how is, but developing the Calvinist analogy further, this is a direct quote from John Calvin. God revealed himself and daily discloses himself in the whole workmanship of the universe. Uh, historically, in Protestantism, there are only two ways of getting the direct revelations from God. That is, God speaking directly to human beings. One is the Bible, and the other is nature. And the idea was that God created the world 6,000 years ago, and it hasn't changed much. So essentially, you're looking at the handiwork of God. And everybody believed that until about 200 years ago when all these Darwin and all the rest of it exploded on the world. And Jonathan Edwards, uh, again, great, probably the greatest American theologian, Calvinist, uh, is very fit and becoming of God so to order things that there should be a voice of his in his works in nature. Uh, so we're, we're basically developing a strain here it's a historical strain, starting from Calvinism in Europe to Puritanism and I didn't mention it, Puritanism in Massachusetts, to Jonathan Edwards, then to Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, who are also from Massachusetts. So what's happening though with Thoreau and Emerson is you're beginning to see these ideas secularized. And so that's their historical significance. Uh, we go to John Muir, in some ways the first real environmentalist, founder of the Sierra Club in a contemporary sense. Uh, but if you read his journals and his writings, I mean, every other word is God. And uh, so he actually, while he considered himself a disciple of Emerson and was hugely influenced by Emerson, um, and Emerson had sort of, you know, his essay, Nature, is all about how the greatest depths of meaning are revealed in nature. But Muir took it into the front lines of political and literary activism. 
Uh, and it was all about finding God in nature. So, uh, so you could say that all of this leads to things like the national wilderness system. And how is wilderness defined? Areas untrammeled by man. What does that mean? Why are they sources of awe and wonder? Because you're actually experiencing God's creation without human messing it up, at least ideally or theoretically. In fact, probably we've messed everything up, so it's, a, it's somewhat of a myth. But, uh, but anyway, people experience it as though it's actually true to the extent that any you know, pure wild areas would exist uh, at all. So we could call them our national cathedrals. Uh, I'll skip that one and, uh, since I'm out of time. But, uh, but I think, though, uh, if you analyze environmentalism in this way, uh, it frankly is a somewhat of a populist religion. And it doesn't really hold up very well if you do like a Thomas Aquinas <laughs> philosophical, you know, theological analysis of all the premises and all of the connections and what you're assuming and so forth. It's really kind of a mishmash. Uh, even the question of what is nature. My students have come around to the idea, having read, read their William Cronin and <laughs> Dan Bodkin and other people like that, that uh, you know, we really have no idea what <laughs> nature is. As, a, as an exact thing, certainly as a goal of public policy. And they were so, uh, and that in fact, to the extent that there is something called nature, it's almost an implicit creationism. It's an implicit idea that, well, there was the creation and it hasn't been changed. Of course, we all know that's not true since Darwin in the 19th century, but it still is there, surviving as kind of an implicit underlying assumption. Um, and in, but the reality is that uh, since basically eco ecology since the 1960s and 70s has regarded nature as a world of constant flux uh, and disturbance. And so even the very idea to restore nature becomes policy-wise and you know, in terms of doing precise theology-wise very hard to to deal with. In fact, it seems more mythological, actually, if you start putting it under that kind of a lens where you're really demanding precision of definitions and, and accommodation. So, um, and then the other thing is that it, in reality, it's impossible to ignore benefits and costs. And that's my last one. <laughs> so, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, my uh, heretical view of environmentalism. I, I specialize in heresies.